call our meeting to order. So welcome everybody, Fran Inman, uh, Chair of the California Transportation Commission, and delighted to be here. It says on my agenda that we're going to do introductions. So I think we'll do introductions first, and then I'll come back and share a few little thoughts, and we'll get going. So I'm Fran, and everybody, if you will, speak into the microphone for the webcast. Paul Van Kenanberg. Hillary Norton. Terry Anderson. Tokes Omashakin. Jim Davis. Mike Kiever. Ray Tritt. Ellen Greenberg. Jeremy Ketchum. Susan Branson. be joined by Commissioner Kehoe, I believe, in a little bit, but we're going to get started. So anyway, this is our fourth project delivery workshop, and really appreciate these. These are some of the best meetings we have, in my opinion, where we all sit around the table and roll up our sleeves together and really um, try to brainstorm some really good ideas. So anyway, I want to thank Caltrans once again and the experts that are here to help us and also our partners out there I see in the audience. We do appreciate you. And I think it's really just a good opportunity to have some really, really good discussions. So I'm going to encourage everybody to lean in, jump in, and let's make this a very engaged, uh, open, and productive discussions today. So on our agenda, we have some really, really important topics. We have SB 743 and the implementation and how we're all um, taking a look at that, and the Caltrans capital outlay support budget, and then an overview of the construction manager and general contractor and delivery um, methodology. And I would say if you have any other world ideas, feel mm -hmm. free to throw them in there too. So with that, because it is a public meeting, I'm going to open up to public comments. Do we have anybody from the public that wants to speak? I see folks looking back and forth, but I don't see anybody jumping in there. So with that, Ellen, I'm going to pass it to you, please. Ellen Greenberg. Hey, thank you, Commissioner Inman. I think that's uh, there director opening comments from director Michelle. Yes. Oh, oh, sorry, Tokes. <laughs> <laughs> I just ran my agenda. That that's uh, that's that's okay. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to get a chance to be at this first uh, workshop. Uh, I had a quick briefing this week earlier this week with staff and got a good understanding of uh, the history of this workshop and. Um, what we are going to be trying to achieve with these uh, these workshops uh, moving forward. Before we, uh, before I sort of run through some of the things that we'll talk about that you mentioned, uh, uh, Chair Inman, uh, want to recognize um, our staff that is here. You met some of our senior team um, who are sitting at the table already, but several members of our uh, executive board are uh, in the room as well. I want to thank them for their presence um, here today. And also want to thank uh, the CTC staff. I know they work behind the scenes quite a bit to get ready for a day like today. Uh, thank the, uh, the, the team at the, at the CTC for their, for their work. And, um, and also uh, specifically recognize the executive director as this would be her last uh, workshop with us. She's smiling. Um, because she's like, thank goodness I don't have to do this anymore. No, I'm, I'm joking. No, I know she's not. But uh, thank you for the partnership and the engagement that we've had in just a, a few weeks and a few months um, uh, on the efforts like this. And, and also, and finally, thank you to uh, the commissioners that are present um, for the partnership uh, and work as well. Uh, there's a lot of work that lays ahead for us as we look to uh, make this uh, state's transportation system the best that it can be. So three uh, very quick points that I'll touch on um, that, we're, that we're going to cover. Uh, as Chair Inman said already, we're going to talk about 
um, SB 743, uh, the people that will be leading that uh, for us from uh, the Caltrans side of the discussion, uh, Ellen Greenberg, who you know uh, very well already um, and is an expert uh, on this issue, and uh, Jeremy Ketchum, I was in a meeting with Jeremy earlier, uh, I'm not sure where he is, but I'm sure he's in here somewhere, but oh yeah, yeah, he's down on the other end. Uh, Jeremy as well will be leading the discussion. Um, so I think 743 is probably one of the most important issues uh, that we will be tackling in the coming weeks and, and, and months as it relates to um, how we um, embrace and adopt the, the tenets of, uh, of this law. Um, it represents clearly a, an evolution, a fundamental shift in how we look at uh, transportation projects, how we measure the environmental impacts of transportation projects, because we're talking about a shift that a lot of states are not even anywhere close to making yet. Um, and shifting from level of service analysis um, and things like vehicle delay to actually looking at um, uh, vehicle miles travel and the impact of you know traveling more uh, uh, more on the road and what that does um, to uh, to transportation what it does to to land use what it does to the environment in general so this is uh, this is something that I've heard quite a bit uh, about from our uh, uh, our partners and stakeholders, they are very concerned about this. As a matter of fact, uh, just had a, a, a conversation today where um, there's a lot of interest in the steps that will be taken as it relates to uh, developing guidelines, uh, possible mitigation as it relates to 743. So um, the, this is a, this is a, as everybody in the room knows well more than I do, this is a, a law that's been around for um, a, at least seven years. Um, and we're uh, still sort of in the early phases of figuring out how to actually implement it, but um, I, I think we'll get there. I'm excited about um, uh, the work that lays ahead on this because I think it'll yield some very positive change, uh, especially in the environment front for, for our state. Uh, second of all, uh, we will get a chance to talk about um, uh, just project delivery in general for us at, at Caltrans. Um, as you know, you've heard the news already. We got some exciting news. The man sitting second to my left is our uh, new chief engineer. Uh, he's, uh, he's, I've had a few brief conversations with him already. Mike Kiever is excited to take on this role. Um, uh, it's a very important role for the department. Um, the, the project delivery work, it's probably some of the most important uh, work that we're uh, obviously measured on. People want to see um, progress in, in project delivery. Um, right now we've got uh, roughly $10 billion worth of work uh, in the pipeline. Uh, with SB1, there will be another infusion of roughly $5 billion worth of work that goes into that pipeline. Uh, I think in the fourth quarter alone, uh, we're delivering, in this past fourth quarter alone, we're delivering uh, more in the fourth quarter alone than we delivered in the entire previous uh, uh, previous calendar year, so uh, Mike's got his uh, he's got his work cut out for him. We're going to try to help him and, and and definitely be by his side as he leads us in the effort to do a better job, uh, do the best job we can do um, uh, with with project uh, with project delivery. Um, and finally, and third, we will uh, get a chance to hear from Ray Tritt. We just met Ray just just now. Uh, he's been introduced to me as the innovation man, so he's got <laughs> uh, he's he's got his work cut out for him from that standpoint. Innovation is something that I'm uh, keenly interested in, but uh, Ray is going to be talking to us about CMGC and how we are implementing CMGC um, in, uh, in the department. I am a big proponent of. Um, of alternative delivery methods, and this is something that Ray has got a lot of expertise on. So, um, look forward to seeing uh, the, the presentation and being part of the discussion as we talk about CMGC. As you know, we have um, new guidelines. I'm glad that stopped, <laughs> uh, at least temporarily. Uh, I'm, I'm, we have regulation that uh, allows us to to do CMGC as it relates to ten million dollars, uh, ten million dollars and over, uh, in projects, and and that's been something that's passed as of recent. So, um, when it comes to thinking about how uh, we 
uh, achieve the efficiencies that we've been discussing uh, as relates to SB1, for example, um, that's one of the major tools that we will be uh, obviously using to achieve some of those efficiencies. Um, and um, uh, uh, the innovative work around that is something that Ray uh, will, be, will be talking to us about. So in a quick nutshell, those are the three items that we'll cover. Um, SB 743, um, uh, uh, Mike Kiever will talk to us about project delivery and how we are uh, being able to, how we're working to deliver such a big uh, pipeline uh, that we have now. And finally, we'll hear from Ray Tread on CMGC. Madam Chair. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Didn't mean not to include you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there wasn't anything there. I was just for once reading the script, which I don't have a reputation for doing. So <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, Happy New Year. Okay, Miss Ellen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, get in the right mode here. There we go. Um, so, uh, Tunks, I think, made some helpful opening remarks. Uh, I do want to note that Jeremy Ketchum is here with me today. Chris sends his apologies. Um, we didn't want him breathing on us, and he's home nursing, nursing a virus. So, um, this presentation today is organized in four parts. We've made a few additions to the slide deck, just to put in some title slides to kind of help organize the presentation. But the slides that uh, those of you who have printouts, uh, those slides are all part of the presentation in the order they're in, but you might see some additional title slides. Um, so uh, your questions and comments are welcome as we go along. That's uh, the pleasure of having a workshop setting, so please don't hesitate. Um, I want to lead off partly by saying this is very much a work in progress. And you know, Tokes was talking about the interest from our partners, and um, part of that interest and eagerness is because we are in a process, and folks would love for it to be done and have the answers, and we have some answers, but there's a lot of answers we're still working on developing. So um, I expect we'll be speaking about this again as time goes on, as we make as we make progress. Um, so. I think a nice way to start uh, is to say, you know, why are we doing this? You know, what is this about in the big picture? It's easy to get stuck in the weeds, particularly when we're talking about CEQA. Uh, but we want today to keep our eyes on the big picture and talk about SB 743's changes to the California Environmental Quality Act as one of many steps that we're taking along with partners and with the broader administration to make progress in some key priority areas that I think we all uh, hold as important areas for us uh, in which to make progress. So uh, things that we're going to be touching on in the presentation, right? transportation improvements, obviously that's central to our work together. Climate, uh, housing, and everyone's aware, uh, I know this has been a, a topic of discussion in the joint meetings with the Air Resources Board. So there's a housing component in 743, then the broader area of environmental protection, right, that's always associated with our CEQA, our CEQA work and our project work. So it, this big picture, I think, helps provide a context. Um, and I want to just uh, draw attention in terms of the climate issues uh, the state, it's 2020, right? So the state's first set of climate goals were goals for 2020. And the news that I love sharing with people is that the state is meeting its 2020 climate goals, which is pretty great. Um, and that success is largely, though certainly not exclusively, associated with changes in the energy sector that have brought a higher proportion of uh, renewables into the energy grid, into the mix. So it's great news that the 2020 goals are being met. The next set of goals are for 2030. And to meet those goals, the 2030 goals, there has to be progress in the transportation sector. Um, and those of you who are familiar uh, with the governor's executive order from September EO in 1919, um, the executive order uh, expressed, um, you know, the governor expressed the a mandate for the State Department 
to work towards this goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector and highlighted in the executive order the fact that 40% of greenhouse gas emissions in the state come from tailpipes. It's actually around 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions are associated with the transportation sector more broadly. So that is, you know, that's part of the background against which we're making these changes in 743. So um, just to dive into some, some key concepts uh, before getting into the, the CEQA changes. So the idea of making progress in the transportation sector, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, the, the framework for that is established in the Climate Change Scoping Plan prepared and adopted by the Air Resources Board. And it's based on what they call the Mobile Source Strategy from 2016. The Mobile Source Strategy has three key parts that are shown in this next slide. And the three parts, it's a three-part strategy. Everybody loves a three-part strategy because we can use that three-legged stool talk. You know, everybody likes that. Everyone's always comfortable with the three-legged stool. Yeah, it's great. So, okay, if we had a three-legged stool to reduce the transportation, greenhouse gas emissions, they would be cleaner vehicle technologies, right? So the zero emission vehicle push, I think everyone's familiar, big emphasis in the department. We've talked about that before. The department has a program that's going really well to support zero emission vehicles. Uh, there's also a, a very significant effort around cleaner fuels that are used in internal combustion engine vehicles. So it's not all about zero emission vehicles, also about cleaner fuels. That's two legs of the stool. The third leg of the stool is changes in the amount that people drive and that comes under the heading of VMT reduction. And this, the width of those bands on the slide are indicating kind of how much of the GHG reduction comes from these different program components or strategies. So uh, in the scoping plan and the mobile source strategy, the biggest area for gains or GHG reductions is through the zero emission vehicle program. Uh, the second most substantial set of reductions are associated with cleaner fuels, and then VMT reduction is that, that third piece. Now, uh, you'll see there's this red outline that's over a chunk of the green, um, and that was added you know, recently because of the possible federal rollback of emission standards. And um, candidly, I was somewhat reluctant to, to share this slide because we've had a lot of questions like, how does the safe rule stuff affect the 743 stuff? And they are separate. Like in terms of actually managing change or what are the consequences going to be or what risks to project delivery might be associated with the safe rule, we're not talking about that. Um, the relationship is that if the gains that are expected through zero emission vehicles are not made, it means there's more emphasis on the need to reduce vehicle miles traveled as a means to bring our greenhouse gas reduction down. It, it, so, yeah. Uh, do you want questions or do you want to finish? I'm happy to take you, questions. Okay. Um, so does that... Before the safe vehicle rule came sneaking up or roaring up, depending on how you look at it, um, we had hoped that in the heavy duty sector we would begin to see some cafe standards. So we didn't have those yet, but we were hopeful. So are we, we just put all that aside now? I mean, it, how, how are you dealing with that? So I'm going question. to offer a uh, kind of a amateur comment because it's not my area of, of focus in my work. But I feel very safe, 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 uh, safe pun. Um, I feel comfortable saying that the Air Board is not going to drop their interest or their pursuit in cleaner heavy duty vehicles. And we have a sustainable freight action plan. The department, you know, is one of the parties working on that. Uh, but we're not going to be, you know, supported by a regulatory framework that involves the federal, uh, you know, the federal side of the regulations. But I feel very comfortable saying the state is not turning its back on the opportunities in the heavy duty sector. So I guess the question then is, so the green band, the cleaner vehicle technologies, is based on, the, the bigger band is based on the world as we knew it prior to the safe 
vehicle role. That's right. right. Okay. Okay. And then we have this piece out of the middle that if the safe vehicle rules really are implemented, that's what the smiley face will look like without that wedge in it, right? Right, and, and these are, out. this is a, you know, a judgment from the Air Board okay, about what they think numbers. the impact okay. would be. Right. That's good. Exactly. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, the re that, that all is background to understand what we're now facing, but it's also helpful to understand what's the timeline associated with 743. So one thing, uh, and uh, the director mentioned this, is the statute was passed in 2013, and the reason we like to mention that is it is an indication of the complexity of implementation of this change, that it took five years after passage for the CEQA guidelines to be amended. So, you know, we recognize this has been uh, both a complex and a controversial process um, that's, you know, among the reasons we are working so closely with partners on this. It, it's not easy or obvious, um, and, you know, that five-year period is, a, is in part a reflection of that. So in 2018, the CEQA guidelines were amended. It has been very helpful to us to have those amended guidelines. Uh, the amendments address both the implications of the changes for seek review of land development projects and also seek review of transportation projects. And of course, you know, these are changes to seek it's not just about the department, right? This affects all public agencies that are acting as lead agencies in either type of uh, seek review. So I'm going to look over meaningfully at Jerry who him over here every now and then so he can tell me when I'm going wrong because he's the secret expert. If you, when you're not, I'll keep going, jump in any time. Um, so, right, so keep in mind, right, all the agencies around the state are grappling with this. Um, there's a real benefit to that in a way because we're learning from some of the partners. Uh, some of the cities, particularly the larger cities, have already implemented 743, have invested a lot of uh, time and technical resources in establishing their processes. So we're kind of, we're, this is a real, uh, we're, we're in this together. We're all, all in this together. So uh, we are working with right, all the pro transportation project sponsors, you know, we're trying to figure out what is, what's the meaning. So our focus today uh, is on transportation projects, particularly, you know, on system projects on the state highway system. And I want to uh, emphasize that what we're talking about is relevant to all projects on our system, regardless of fund source or sponsoring agencies. So there's been a lot of interest, right, in sales tax projects. Uh, we had a meeting at the Self-Help Counties Coalition Conference. Um, Commissioner Ron Kindenberg was able to sit in. We had a very strong participation from folks in the Self-Help Counties. We're continuing to um, interact with them, right? So there is a lot of interest. Um, so it applies to projects regardless of fund source. There is a focus on capacity increasing projects. So there's lots and lots of projects that are unaffected, right? Where, because they don't have an impact on the amount of travel. So we'll, we'll get into this more, but just to make sure, um, you know, I try to bring people's blood pressure down instead of elevating elevating people's blood pressure. So our, our paving projects, our rehabilitation and repair projects, our safety projects broadly uh, can be characterized as broadly not affected by these changes, which is really good news because we want that work to be continuing. So the focus is on projects that have an impact on, on automobile use or vehicle miles traveled. So um, I've realized that a lot of folks for whom this is a new a new phrase or a new concept, um, and we talk VMT, VMT, I'd like to take a minute to say, hey, what's VMT? Uh, so VMT is an acronym for vehicle miles traveled. It's a cumulative measure of distance driven. In the context of SB 743, we're talking about passenger travel. So sometimes we talk about VMT, often it's, vehicle, it's passenger and freight vehicles together. In 743, we're focused on passenger travel. And then on the right side of the slide, just saying, you know, well, what are the factors that affect VMT? Yes, question. So can we go back to the wedge page? Yes. So, but this includes everything, 
This does include okay. everything, right? Okay, okay. So of the green wedge, which is cleaner vehicle technologies, what portion of that green would be passenger? I don't have an answer. We can follow up about that. I need to talk to the airboard folks. I think that's interesting because if SB 743 excludes freight, but the freight sector is one of the areas where we're really focusing on trying to green it, it would be good for us, I think. Uh, and the reason I ask this is because I look at the bus migration, and if, if I look at the scoping plan, the, the buses aren't a big part of that green wedge. You know, so I think understanding that green wedge will help everybody in the 743 discussion, too. Right, I, I agree, and we can get some more information about that. Um, I think that the uh, staff and members of the Air Board are trying to reflect a reasonable expectation, so there are, I would say, probably being conservative in terms of the introduction of technologies that are not now available, which would suggest it's much more heavily focused on the passenger travel because we have that technology now available. Okay, and don't be shy, other folks either. This is this is billed as a workshop, so by definition, we all have to work. <laughs> you're doing a great job. You're doing great. Okay, so um, looking at that list of factors that affect vehicle miles traveled is kind of laying the foundation for talking uh, a little bit later about, well, how do we reduce VMT? So reducing the average length of vehicle trips through more, uh, more efficiently, uh, more communities that operate more efficiently, increasing average vehicle occupancy, combining trips, mode share is a huge one, right? Increasing walk, bike, and transit. Um, so these are some of the factors that can affect VMT. So with, with that background, let's talk a little bit about the specific changes that 743 is bringing. There are, again, two main areas uh, that Caltrans is involved in, the land use side and then the secret review of projects on the state highway system. So I'm just going to touch briefly on the land use side so you're familiar with the broad set of uh, implications of these changes and also because this is the piece that relates uh, most directly to supporting housing development as one of those as one of those policy priorities. Um, apologize for the wordiness every now and then it's like it's worth it to see the actual language. So this is from right from uh, the amended code of regulations of the CEQA, the statute itself establishes uh, a presumption that projects that are um, near transit stops, near major stops, and projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled compared to uh, typical conditions in the broader area, that those kinds of projects would be presumed to have a less than significant transportation impact. It's somewhat challenging language, but the gist of it is projects that infill projects are assumed to create more transportation efficiencies and therefore to not have a transportation impact. So there is a streamlining component that is uh, central to supporting housing production through implementing 743. Two questions. Yeah. Does the overall guidelines give a d definition of existing major transit stop? There is a definition in statute, yes, that has to do with frequency of service. Okay. And the second question is, has um, there been a study, so my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be totally off on this. So the governor's housing folks have laid out the need for $3.5 million, $3.5 million housing units. Is that correct? Am I right? And it is. And so have we quantified how many housing units we can put into something that meets this definition? Uh, no, so the and the department hasn't done any of that work, but some of the regional agencies have started to try to map that. With their housing, uh, yeah, the their housing the element. Numbers, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any of that, those figures back yet? Uh, I think there are various states. Depends on where you are in the 
Yeah. Okay. Great. Sorry about that. Bill Higgins with CalCog and our COGS are in the middle. For example, I know MTC is right in the middle of it right now. SIG, our SCAG is in the middle. The San Joaquin Valley folks are still about two years out from their numbers. We still have the second bullet point on here represents another aspect of the streamlining for infill projects. Um, and there's also language providing this same um, kind of uh, streamlining provision for affordable housing meeting certain standards. So that second point is that automobile delay is no longer considered a sequent impact for projects in any location. So this is something folks have probably heard about. This is essentially uh, prohibiting the use of level of service standards as a criteria to identify impacts under CEQA. And that is a very substantial change because many, many of our agencies have been using a level of service threshold to determine significance. So, you know, one way you can think about it broadly is where we're changing from looking at intersection level impacts of a de on the development project side, intersection level impacts to looking at impacts on the much on a broader network that's about you know how much driving is um, essentially is stimulated by this new project as opposed to you know how many seconds of increased delay might this project cause so that's a pretty fundamental a pretty fundamental change so in, in the old days if you had a level of service that you were going to trigger of f then you needed to mitigate so that that could be into something manageable, say something better than an F, a D minus. Um, so if auto delay is no longer considered, aren't our communities gonna go ballistic if they're more and more delayed? I'm just wondering how in reality, you get things built and approved if, first of all, Joe Q Public doesn't really speak our LOF and that kind of LOS and that kind of stuff. But they know how long it takes them to get to school or get to work or get to the market or wherever they, they need to go. So I'm just wondering because our challenge with the housing goals is that. We've all come together and said, yes, we've got to build more housing. We think we know how we can build it smarter and better. And we still can't get it done because there's all the pushback. So I'm just wondering in practical world terms, is this really going to fly, Senator? <laughs> I get nervous when you use that title. Um, I want to just say I am very uh, sympathetic to Fran's remarks. Um, uh, we are developing, uh, you know, a controversial uh, bike lane quite a block from my house, removing uh, several hundred uh, parking spaces in an older residential area. And I think we're going to see, we are already seeing controversy uh, and um, it is quickly linked with um, scooters and bikes <clears throat> and other, you know, what we consider tra transportation uh, innovations. So, uh, you know, we may not have, I think we are going to be hearing about this. I think Caltrans is going to be hearing about this and the city transportation and streets departments and that sort of thing. So I think we'll be getting more uh, real-time input, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, from the citizens and we're going to have to learn to, from that and, and to deal with it. Uh, I think I'd like to think most people understand in Southern California the impacts of climate change. We're having, you know, extreme weather year-round, hot and cold, rainy and not. So uh, people, I think, want something to be done, but don't necessarily want to be kicked out of their cars. <laughs> exactly. And it's a tri it's going to be a trial for our local elected officials. So I want you to respond, and then I'd like to share. 
So I, uh, it's been helpful in our discussions uh, within the department and with partners to talk about you know, the reasons for this change. Or the, and they really relate to a set of unintended consequences from the use of level of service standards over time. Um, and among those unintended consequences have been you know, now a kind of a familiar uh, response when neighbors do have wanted to create obstacles to projects of challenging projects under CEQA because of intersection level delay. Um, and then mitigation, which in many cases might have solved, in quotes, the intersection problem, but that had the unintended effect of degrading the environment for pedestrians and cyclists. And you know, those are you know, two of the concerns. The other is the cost of that mitigation being assigned to new development. That's one of the, the responses to trying to streamline housing, eliminate the burdens associated with specific mitigations that are focused on individual intersections. So you know, it's, a, it's kind of a bundle of reasons why this change has been put into place. Um, and I think, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see what the community response it is. It is it is a big it is a big change. I was just gonna comment that I liked your point about that this is going to lead to transit efficiency because I think you know seeing this in my own neighborhood that is a historic neighborhood that was single family but built around streetcars and then we went to cars now we're going to bike lanes and now we're asking for a bus rapid transit back in so. Now that we're starting to ratchet up the number of units, the focus on how we actually get more people in more efficient vehicles, I think really is a great standard in what we're focused on. One of the things that I was curious about with 743 is how we can uh, address some of the sort of tangible intangibles about in getting people to actually ride and be riders on this transit because there are some things that are not vehicle related but really do, especially for women, affect whether or not we get on those vehicles. Um, we talk a lot at the CTC about quality of stops, about lighting, about things that I think would be, it would be helpful under this, this regulation to start thinking about how, with metrics, how they contribute because I think now we've got people who are really weighing how these you know, this opportunity to do the right thing could also affect triggering CEQA. And so really thinking about how we can help define the, the, the total public realm around moving people into transit, because Fran is um, a really good metronome about metrics. Right. And like, where are we winning? And, and I think that what we're finding in a lot of the responses about how people travel and how women travel is that in order to use this, it's got to be about an environment around transit and not just the transit itself. So how can we start looking at the ways we can win beyond the, the vehicle right. transit options themselves? Great point. Not just about the service that's on the street, but yes. about its attractiveness for real people making real choices. Safety, lighting, you know, that kind of human infrastructure as well. Yes. So I'm going to do my best to channel my fellow Commissioner Lucy Dunn, who just sent us this note that she's watching us. But um, anyway, she, Lucy, in her wonderful innovation, uh, came up with the idea, and it's actually being piloted in Orange County, and it was just one trip. Just give me one trip. That's all I'm asking for is just one That's trip a else. week. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's brilliant in terms of really, you know, if it asks people to make a big change, it's really, really hard. But if we look at Weight Watchers, they tell us just count a few points, just count a few points and we'll get there. And so I do think that um, if we can get a lot of these grassroots ideas, I just worry when we, when we say to our public, we don't care if you're in automobile delay, we're not going to measure that. They are going to turn off on us and, you know, it just gets their neck bowed up. So, yeah. So I, I do want to uh, mention that 
some of the local agencies and indeed some of the MPOs, you know, are working on the communication side of this. So LADOT has produced a video, you know, specifically introducing the idea of EMT, talking about what the city is trying to do to change the broader environment, to make these other modes um, attractive. So uh, we're not alone in having concerns about bringing people along with us. Um, that said, you know, there are choices about how we implement some aspects of this, but the level of service piece is not a choice. It's in the statute. Uh, we're prohibited from using it as a metric. We have to figure out the most uh, effective and constructive way to do that. Um, so there is, I think, some really effective messaging happening, and definitely it's going to be needed. Thanks, Ellen. Um, just a comment, and uh, I don't know how much of this Caltrans is able to take on, because these are huge uh, questions all over the state. Uh, but if we are looking at uh, uh, VMT as uh, you know, a reflection of what kind of a, a, what we want to see in new development. And level of service is no longer an issue we're going to be looking at. And we're going to, in fact, presume that uh, uh, BMT is the, is the better measure. I would like to see, and I have yet to see it in San Diego, maybe other places have it, what kind of data do we have on load shift when we start implementing uh, more transit and, and multimodal and micro transit? You know, what, what's, the, what's the data show, mm -hmm. for sure? And I've asked my city for it, but I've asked Sandy for it. So I'll ask Caltrans for it, too. Because I think we need to look at these numbers. When, when, um, when France says, uh, you know, maybe the average citizen, the older citizen, the disabled citizen, or others are going to be upset with these uh, changes, I think we need to say, well, this is what we see happening. Maybe this is where the trend is going. Right, and we actually, we do have, we've been developing material, uh, the Division of Transportation Planning um, has been developing some material looking at the benefits of different strategies. I think that a challenge for, you know, the many, many, many of us in the state who don't live in transit-rich environments now um, is to realize that there are places that kind of operate more efficiently with less dependence on the car, and it has to do with a wide range of factors that relate to land use, design, services, safety, security. Um, so it's never going to be a one, one move that gets you to the maximum benefit. So it's a complicated set of changes, and we want to get our communities you know, on a path to where people have uh, choices that they're going to pick because they're attractive and they work for them and you know that's the ultimate goal and they are not to punish anybody not to make things harder but actually to make things easier while we're also meeting our environmental and climate goals it's a big lift all right but that's what we are that's what we're aiming towards so when we talk about so the land use side in one piece the department's involved in that through our LDIGR program local development intergovernmental review and you know we are going to be working with the locals and, and looking at the, the transportation impacts of land development projects but we're going to focus here on transportation project review so the amended CEQA guidelines make clear specifically state that VMT is generally the most appropriate measure to use to evaluate transportation impacts, and we're going to be using VMT in CEQA analysis and determinations of significance in our CEQA documents. Um, and again, uh, it's regardless of funding source or project sponsor, and in cases where, uh, you know, occasionally the department designates another agency as lead agency for CEQA, and if there is a designation of another agency's lead agency, that agency will be using VMT as well. So there's not, you know, like a, an alternative pathway that we're making available. Projects that are reducing VMT, or this should be on the slide, or don't have an impact on VMT, like our paving program, um, are presumed to have a less than significant impact and don't need to be analyzing VMT. So the focus is really on capacity increasing projects. So let's talk about the shop, specifically, before the questions about the shop come up. So we've been scrubbing the list of shop projects to see, can we say that no shop projects are affected? Um, so our DOTP folks looked at the, the PIDs and for the 2020 shop, and we found two projects that we need to scrutinize a little more. 
more in case their capacity increasing and would be affected. So what that means is, you know, the vast majority of projects that are in the shop are, are unaffected. Okay, still doing okay. Um, Ellen, can I, Ellen, can I ask you a question? I just had a question. Um, what would be another appropriate measure in here? It says you're using that and everyone else will use that. But I don't know what would, would another, I guess, could you explain that? Would another local agency with a transportation project that isn't on a state highway or affected by state use a different measure and what would that be? Yeah, thank you for asking because I failed to point out that um, local agencies may pick another measure that's made clear in the guidelines that, I mean, sorry, sponsoring agencies may pick a different measure. It is not clear what measures would be consistent with the, the policy intent of 743. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, we can expect that some of this is going to wind up being worked out in the courts mm -hmm. as so much, you know, so much of our CEQA practice is informed uh, through CEQA litigation. That's just the experience we've had over 50 years. Um, and obviously the way we implement CEQA now, you know, reflects the case law that we have established. So there are options. There may be agencies that feel like um, using some other delay metric is appropriate to it in the transportation context. I've spoken to people who feel like, no, nope, it's clear from the guidelines and statute there may be no use of level of service, but, you know, there are different interpretations. There's also an opportunity, some agencies may focus on per capita uh, VMT, like how much is indivi or individuals travel on a per capita basis changing versus cumulative. I know uh, Commissioner von Kleinenberg has uh, raised the issue of vehicle hours travel that kind of incorporates uh, several different perspectives, so that's another metric that folks might look at, right? So uh, we're gonna see. Um, we're gonna see going forward. Well. Because I think if you just roll back, what is vehicle miles traveled? Um, a building doesn't really travel. It's us humans that are moving, or it could be goods, but we're, we set aside the freight. So if I look at building a restaurant, that could have some vehicle miles. I assume my customers are gonna come to that or movie theater, or anything we humans like to do. Um, but in reality, if Fran's gonna go to the neighborhood restaurant now instead of going to her favorite restaurant, which is five miles away, building that one closer could be better. And, and, that, and I think that would be reflected in the approach that's been taken, which is to say, so I talked about housing, about supporting housing, but in fact, the structure of the implementation approach supports all kinds of infill development. So sometimes I think about this challenge as like a little bit like algebra, um, where you're trying to solve for something. So if you have an area that doesn't have a grocery store and you add a grocery store and that's what's missing, uh, people may be able to make a shorter trip to the grocery store because they now have that as kind of solving an accessibility challenge. Mm -hmm. So the infill, um, the provisions relating to infill are not solely about housing. Yeah. So they are about kind of this broader land use mix. So, so commercial. Right, mm -hmm. so, so it is, you know, it's the people, right? The buildings aren't causing the trip, it's the people. So just as we have been looking at intersection impacts by using level of service, so our, you know, our established practice is to say, well, the people who are using, who are living in this housing or using this business, what are their travel patterns? How are those patterns changed as a result of a proposed project? So we're still looking at that change in, in people's movement, um, but we're looking more broadly at the amount of travel rather than at the location-specific impact. Well, I mean, I, I just think we have some, it's complicated. So we have an Eat Fresh campaign going on. We're trying not to eat packaged foods. We're trying to do wellness. Well, that means I need to go get some fresh stuff on a much more regular basis than my typical, you know, I, I, I gotta go to the store, it's been three weeks, and there's nothing <laughs> left to eat. Um, <laughs> 
hey, you've been there, you know what that's like. No, but so I, I think this is just really, you know, you mentioned unintended consequences. And I think for all of us to get this right, it's so very important because we're liable to have other unintended consequences if we don't. So everybody chime in here. Right, well again, I'll point out the, the bullet there that says chip, trip chaining and combining purposes. So, you know, I think part of the challenge is supporting places and systems where people are traveling efficiently. So, you know, if you're coming home from work, if you're coming home from the doctor's appointment, a trip to a friend's house, you know, whatever it is, picking up a kid at a soccer game and you stop for your fresh food on the way home, that is a lower VMT way to get your fresh food than coming home from work and going out again in your car to buy that fresh food. So there are a lot of different ways to, you know, to address this or to, to get to the answer, solve the algebra problem is the way I think of it. So I'm, I'm mindful of our time, so I'm gonna maybe move us forward. Yeah, yes. I'm getting a nod. Okay. Um, so transportation project review is focused on capacity increasing projects, right? So um, we talk about potential benefits on the land use side, streamline infill development, so not just housing, but all infill development, which is assumed to be in places that are characterized by lower VMT per person than more spread out development or single use development. So what, you know, the big, the big picture is create communities that are less auto dependent, making active transportation and transit more attractive. On the transportation project side, right, we're looking for transportation investments that uh, align to achieve state climate and air quality goals, as well as public health goals associated with active transportation. So the idea is using 743, make infill land development easier, don't make safety and maintenance projects harder, right? That, that's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a kind of sound bite. So you know, how are we doing this? How do we get to this better future through implementing 743? So we're following uh, the kind of the North Star of the scoping plan and saying we need these VMT reductions. So, Something that I think is helpful to keep in mind is that this uh, change works within the broader CEQA framework, right? So broadly, we still have an emphasis on analysis, disclosure, the selection and consideration of alternatives, the identification of mitigation. So those steps, like the basic steps in the CEQA process are unchanged. Uh, it's the same as for any environmental resource that we would be examining under CEQA and we need to align our project level decision making with these overall goals. So when we start like digging a little deeper, right, so people are familiar with the CEQA framework, you know, a key part is looking at impacts and saying whether they have a, whether there is a significant adverse impact on the environment in relation to different resource areas. That's what we do in our environmental documents, right? So we already have said, okay, not using level of service, using vehicle miles traveled, that's one of the really important basic concepts. This slide is introducing another really important concept for 743 implementation, the idea of induced travel demand. Okay, so this is where it's like, can we just take a break and go to graduate school and then come back and finish the meeting? Um, so, induced travel demand is a phrase that is making reference to the fact that people respond to the characteristics of the system. If, they're, if it's easy to drive, we drive more. And this is kind of a basic supply and demand relationship. So when we talk about uh, the cost of driving, like if you're talking in the context of transportation modeling and when people choose or trip making behavior, People travel more when costs are lower, like you might consume more if costs of some product you like are lower. For instance, gasoline, right? We see more driving when gas cost goes down. So when we talk about cost, it is cost both in dollars and time, right? People bundle those things together. Okay. So the idea of induced demand is saying that when we make it easier to travel, and we do that sometimes by adding capacity to our system, there is a behavioral response from drivers. Drivers change their behavior because suddenly it gets easier to drive. Um, and 
that's not always increasing VMT, right? So all over the state, in our urban areas, folks are going to work at five in the morning, right? Six in the morning, but now more five in the morning to, to avoid traffic. So if we make it easier with more capacity, maybe people are like, oh, I can leave at six again. I don't have to leave at five, or I don't have to leave at four. So some of those behaviors, people might change their time of travel. That doesn't necessarily increase VMT. But other changes, like, oh, it's easier to drive. I'm gonna go somewhere I wouldn't otherwise have gone. That does reflect an, an increase in VMT. So this is where it gets really tricky. So how do we evaluate whether a project that increases capacity will actually have a significant impact on the environment under CEQA? So I mentioned, the okay, so 743 was a change in statute. We then had a change in the CEQA guidelines. There's a third piece of guidance, and that is a, a publication from the Office of Planning and Research that is a technical advisory on implementation of 743. So we've been working with OPR staff, and we are following this technical advisory. And one of the uh, areas of emphasis of this technical advisory is kind of teasing out for us, you know, how do you actually ask this question about significant impact? And, and what is that under CEQA? So the OPR uh, publication specifically says, we're trying to identify an increase in vehicle miles traveled that is induced by a project or attributable to a project. Because lots of folks have said, right, three, you were mentioning, Commissioner, that uh, three and a half million housing units needed in eight years. And people are like, whoa, you know, we're growing. The state is growing, the economy is growing. So of course, we're going to have increased VMT. So what the OPR guidance is, is communicating is that VMT growth that is associated with economic and population growth is not what we are trying to constrain. And this chart attempts to illustrate that. So again, folks are probably familiar in the context of examining uh, potential projects. We often look at what would the future be without the project, right? So all our environmental documents, if there's a full EIR, they will look at a no project condition. So conventionally, that no project condition is with the population growth and with the economic growth, you have some horizon year after your project opens and you're saying, well, if we didn't do this project, what would it look like? So on this graph, that's that blue line where it says VOT without project. That's sort of saying, okay, well, if we looked at a no project option, we would be able to project how much travel there was in a horizon year when we didn't have this added capacity. But we did have the population and economic growth. So in order to look at this induced VMT, or VMT attributable to the project, when we look at the with project scenario, we get a, if we get a different number, it's the difference between those two is considered to be the amount of induced travel, or the travel that's associated with behavioral change. That is a difficult concept to communicate. So, Questions? Comments? Difficult, but do you have a, a real life couple of examples of projects? I mean, the commission just dedicated billions of dollars in 2018, so if you could pick a couple projects, I mean, there's some that come to mind, but just right out here on Highway 50, mm -hmm. HOV lanes, uh, might be, you know, walk to downtown or, you know, I-5, there was a a widening combination with the shop. And I just, I'm wondering how SV743, the guidelines and the implementation strategy, how that might have impacted those projects on the CEQA level. I mean, I, you don't have to use those, but I just was wondering how we could connect the dots to, say, a truck climbing lane where you got freight uh, trucks, a warehouse, and then we've got a lot of highway capacity coming forward on a number of different programs that the commission will be dedicating funding to. So that, I, I don't know if that's too difficult of a question for today, but it's a real life, um, you know, for us, real life issues. Right, well we have, um, we had a question in advance about the Highway 99 business plan, and 
so maybe we can draw some examples from that. And we have a slide on it, so can I get up to that and we'll talk about some specifics. Or, Jeremy, do you have anything you want like to add right now, or you want to get to that part? Let's go. Okay. All right. Because I. That is a very reasonable question. <laughs> like, let's have some examples. So, any questions on the one question? Yeah. Uh, just a comment. This is Mike Woodman, um, Nevada County Transportation Commission Chair of the North State Super Region. Um, induced demand is really one of those issues that we have to get right. Um, there are probably 20 or so what I consider credible induced demand studies throughout the country. Um, those studies have been focused on urban congested highways, um, and there's no induced demand studies that cover rural state highway projects. Um, for the rural state pro highway projects, um, you don't have a lot of the characteristics that go into induced demand. Uh, you don't have the long congested periods. You don't have congested parallel facilities. Um, you don't have uh, transit that's on viable headways and a number of others. I won't bore you with all the details. Um, you also have situations where you have a state highway project that is capacity increasing. Um, to our community, it's a safety project, but it doesn't quite raise to the level of triggering safety funding for the project. But the community, and for our highway project, uh, doesn't want to see any more fatalities. Um, and also, they want the highway capacity improved for mass evacuation uh, for fires. Um, so these are things that need to be taken into consideration, and there needs to be a distinct kind of rural lens when we talk about induced demand and make sure we work with the Rural Counties Task Force, the North State Super Region, as well as our end users that are the consultants that do the CEQA analysis to make sure we get it right. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'm looking forward to meeting with you and your colleagues in a few weeks. I know we have that scheduled. So, uh, Ellen, before you yeah. move on, that brings to mind um, Commissioner Van Kanijenberg and I, as well as Susan and our staff, um, just were touring San Luis Obispo, and we happened to arrive just after the grapevine was closed for five days, and those folks weren't that excited to see us. Or maybe they were really excited to see us, I guess. We thought our timing was great. But I think as we look at our resiliency planning, too, because we know that is front and center uh, for all of us to make sure that we have resiliency in all of our areas, and we have Unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of Mother Nature's issues, whether it's the fire or the flooding or whatever, but I do think the resilience, so we may need to make sure that the unintended consequences of trying to figure all this out doesn't have adverse effects. And, and I think to our rural partners, especially because um, they tend to be, uh, have longer <laughs> stretches that they need to do but I, before we I know we need to move off of this but I think this slide really um, we need to spend a lot of time here to make sure we get it right because I really don't know what kind of science there is it, it feels to me and I keep going back to the human factor but we're all living longer we're living larger than our parents did for the most part um, we're certainly trying to be more active <laughs> as we age and stuff, so I just wonder, you know, what does it mean? And the project, I think you really have to study what we're all doing anyway, and really know, you know, what, what are Fran's vehicle miles traveled? Maybe Fran and Ron, because usually if we're going somewhere together, uh, at least on the weekends, you know, we might both be in the car, but during the week it's definitely me doing my thing and my husband doing his, so there's, there's some difference there, but I think it's so important that we don't do it wrong. I just really worry uh, that we need to test ourselves and test ourselves and test ourselves again to make sure that we get it right. I, I think change is hard and so we have to expect that and we're all rolling up our sleeves and, and, and going, uh, but let's make sure that we really do ask ourselves, it's not the building or it's not the house, it's how 
you know, my kids are going to private school, they're not going to the local school. I mean, I rode my bike to school, but, you know, my kids didn't. Uh, so, I think there's so many things here involved with how we live our lives. Well, so I, if I may, I'd like to respond to the really important comments that Mike made about the rural projects in rural areas. And um, I apologize for not kind of having an illustration of this explicitly. So a lot of our rural areas, especially the areas that are outside the MPOs, right? So there are rural areas within MPOs, rural areas outside the MPOs. Right? We have 10 counties in, well, we have five counties in the state with a actually declining population growth um, forecast by the Department of Finance through 2050. And we have others that have stable or you know, very slow growth projected. So we have a, a lot of areas where there is not congestion currently, and where there is not congestion projected. And in those areas, there's not going to be a gap in those two, between those two lines. Because this whole phenomenon of induced travel is a phenomenon that occurs when there is congestion. It's only when there's a really high level of demand that adding capacity causes people to change their behavior. So that like if there if it's easy to drive around now and there's a change in the freeway, it's not going to cause these changes. So again, it, it's a subtlety, but it's a really important subtlety in terms of the rural areas. So we do expect that the implications of these changes are going to be uh, much more substantial in the urban areas. So that, that's one thing to note. Um, the other thing is I was, I was mentioning that the CEQA framework that we're all accustomed to applies here with 743. So one part of that framework is the opportunity for a lead agency to make findings of overriding considerations, right? There are certain requirements, but there is that opportunity. And so an issue such as evacuation routes in an area that doesn't have a network that provides alternate routes, you know, that is one of uh, numerous issues that might be identified as a basis for overriding considerations. So, like other areas examined under CEQA, you know, there is, uh, you know, the lead agency is responsible for weighing project benefits and impacts. So, you know, there's, there's never one resource area that is absolute. And uh, the statute, the statutory changes, you know, specifically say 743 does not eliminate the need to address safety. Or to, you know, to any safety concerns are always foremost in our minds. Um, so that is part of you know part of the challenge of bringing this into our system, right? We all we will continue to look at safety. We will be looking at the issues associated with resiliency, and you know many of those are emerging in a way that's more prominent than they have been before. So you know we, we have those opportunities. Uh, again, not, it's not going to be easy, but you know. There is, uh, there is that opportunity. We, we as a lead agency, and we expect other lead agencies, will be, will be, balancing, uh, will be balancing the findings on VMT with other considerations. Ellen, just a question. Do you see where we may have to try and figure out, uh, from a rural perspective, um, guidance for the rural areas as well, and, and, and what flexibility there is, and then providing some guidance or consistency between rural areas? Yes, so, so Mike mentioned specifically uh, this issue of the availability of data or studies that have been done on behavior change. So, you know, one aspect is the, just the methods that we use are gonna be different, and we may be doing qualitative analysis in rural environments where we are able to do quanti quantified analysis in other areas. So, you know, there are some tools available to um, assess likely induced travel impacts based on historic studies, and those are available only in urbanized areas uh, because that's where the historical studies have have uh, been do been documented. So, you know, we will be reflecting that. Um, so, I, I think that uh, I want to mention also we're working very closely with staff from the Office of Planning and Research and the Air Board, um, and. Part of that process is trying to gain agreement on these technical issues, like how actually these projections, projections will be made. And it's a slog. 
Uh, so we, you know, we are we are sharing that. Let's get it right, um, and that means bringing people around the table who have different views of what the best technical approach is. And you know, we're really gra grappling with that. Uh, Jeremy and his colleagues from DEA, our traffic operations team. I mean, I haven't yet acknowledged the fact that we have folks from really uh, around the department who are engaged in this: environmental, traffic operations, planning because all of these different disciplines you know, are, are engaged um, in trying to look at these questions. Ellen, do you think, out of respect for our other <coughs> presenters, we could move to the Highway 99? Sure, so happy I think to. That, that would probably be a good realistic. Okay, um, so we have a section on project delivery impact, and the 99 slide is, is here. Um, on, on page, I think it's slide 20. <coughs> Um, so the Highway 99 business plan uh, actually has a pretty long history. It was first developed to identify projects that were going uh, to be put forward as part of the Prop 1B program. Uh, again, folks correct me if I go wrong. Um, and put forward as a basic objective for the Valley, a uh, continuous six lane cross section for 99, obviously bringing the facility to uh, freeway standards throughout. Um, and so the, the document has just been updated uh, through the work of uh, District 6 and 10 and partners. And it, so it provides details of 84 remaining projects. So, and there's a range of project types, capacity increasing projects, some operational improvements, new interchanges, some safety projects. So uh, in terms of delivery impacts, uh, there are, the focus would be on the lane addition. So there are three segments that are four to six lane widenings of uh, general purpose lanes. Two of them are already in PAED, so that's uh, South Madeira, six lane widening, and the Tulare City widening. And then the Madeira North segment uh, hasn't yet been initiated and that'll come along a little later. So one thing we haven't touched on yet is the timing for this change to happen. Um, July 1st, 2020 is a key date. Um, that's when all the cities are required to make this shift for land development projects. And we'll be making the shift for projects that are initiated after July 1st. They'll all be subject to the MT analysis. So uh, the Madeira North pro project is an example of a project, right? It's clearly a capacity increasing project. Um, that would be an example of a project that will be analyzed, you know, under this new uh, under this new system of looking at VMT. So, if there are impacts identified, there's an obligation to mitigate, as with any other resource evaluated, and there are also some limits on the mitigation obligation, and that language is. Regarding the statement of or just the mitigation, the extent to which mitigation is required. Well, we, we would need to mitigate to a less than significant impact, so whatever that delta was between the project future year without and with project, that's kind of the delta that we'd be aiming at to try to mitigate down to. And if we can't mitigate that entire amount, then we would need to look toward a statement of overriding considerations. What, um, so we talked about not including trucks or freight movements, and my fellow commissioner here, uh, Paul, reminds me on a regular basis that we feed America through our valley in the 99th. So take one of these projects. Um, how do we acknowledge or account for the fact that you may need this for a goods movement corridor at the same time you all start using your new methodology I, I think that's going to get real confusing I think there will be confusion so we're looking uh, in terms of the tools we use at particularly at passenger vehicle travel and changes in passenger vehicle travel but in terms of the objectives of the projects and supporting economic activity in the valley. We, I was at the uh, San Joaquin Cog executive director meeting recently, and we talked about this and the fact that you know a, a key purpose of the project is to support the agricultural economy, and there's 
you know, a view of the economic benefit. So again, um, you know, as Jeremy is saying, and I said, if, if the impacts can't be fully mitigated, then there is the opportunity for Caltrans as lead agency to, to identify economic benefits associated with the project and approve a statement of overriding consideration based on those economic benefits if, if there's a judgment that those benefits outweigh the negative impacts associated with VMT impacts. Like, that's the basic framework you know, within CEQA for being able to proceed with the project when there is a significant impact identified. So there's an obligation to mitigate. We expect that we're not always going to be able to fully mitigate. It's very challenging to do that, but there is an obligation with reasonable, proportional mitigation. Sorry, I'm probably not getting the words exactly right. Um, and then there is that opportunity, again, as with a safety concern or a resiliency concern, um, there may be judgments made that the economic development benefits outweigh the disbenefits associated with the VMT increase. Yes. I just a quick question. How would you, what would be examples of potential mitigation on the Madeira 99 as an example to mitigate the increase? So, <coughs> I think that a positive opportunity comes from the fact that the mitigation doesn't have to be directly on the facility. When we talk about VMT impacts, it's more of an area-wide approach. Um, so we would be uh, looking with the local project sponsors and stakeholders at, you know, are there places where there is an opportunity to improve pedestrian or bike condition so that we might get some mode shift? Are there places where we might be able to enhance transit service to get some mode shift or put some express bus service on 99 that doesn't exist presently? Maybe uh, focusing on connecting the university campuses or connecting people to healthcare. You know, we need to really, I think the comments that Commissioner Inman was making about, you know, understand people's needs. So we may be uh, really looking it through a very detailed lens at are there some you know, de specific demands that we haven't aimed at in terms of providing services, offering people some improved services, which again, we're trying to make things better here, right? So it may take a really different approach. Uh, but then there are also some larger scale changes um, broadly, not specific to 99, but there's a lot of interest in the state in using um, pricing signals, in some cases it may be parking pricing, you know, in urban areas. Um, so our, our partners in LA, LA Metro, LA DOT, SFCTA, they're studying how they can use pricing to try to change travel behavior. Um, that's, you know, those are programs that our partners already have going. We'll be looking at what they learned from those. Um, so that's a set of strategies. Um, the other is, you know, what kind of benefits can we get from our, our different strategies around managed lanes, hot lanes, you know, how can we use the capacity on the freeways in a way that, that does manage demand and really supports higher vehicle occupancy. So it's a pretty big range of strategies and I think, again, as time goes on, we're going to learn, you know, what works and what's possible. I do want to mention, because I know there's a lot of interest in project delivery impacts, you know, I've talked since I've made several references to the opportunity to make findings of overriding considerations. Those findings can only be made in, when you have a full environmental impact report. So we have uh, quite a number of projects that are now approved under an initial study, mitigated negative declaration. Um, if there's a need to make statements of overriding consideration, the, the type of environmental documentation would need to change and kind of be, those will have to rise to being a full EIR. And in order to make those findings of overriding consideration, there really has to be documentation of the benefits. So, you know, there needs to be like actual study of the benefits alongside the study of the VMT impact. So, you know, those are changes and we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna be learning as we go, working with our partners to try to handle this as, as smartly as we can. Ellen, 30 years ago, we made the decision as a state to improve the 152 corridor connection between I-5 and 101, and about 20 years ago, we made a decision as a state to improve the 46 corridor between 
uh, I-5 and, 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 and 101. And we have a number of east-west connections that, um, that over time, uh, right now we're looking at the, the SR-70 corridor and the safety needs there. I guess, and we don't need to, we, we've exceeded our time here, so I want to be sensitive, but I want to, if, if we could go back and look at, okay, if this was in place then, how would that have affected improving those corridors? Could we have done it? Because I think those have, you know, I think those, we were just out on the 46th corridor two weeks ago, and the high patrol commander for the area was saying, you know, we have a, a solid divider here, we have, you know, we, we've seen fatalities drop dramatically, and he was preaching to us as commissioners the importance of finishing the job. So, you know, I think the, the, this question of, we sometimes, I think the, the point that was made that capacity in, in rural areas is often seen as a safety project to their, to their um, and, you know, what, what increased the demand was that um, more and more people just want to go see the ocean um, and more and more activities are on the, on the coast and so people from inland want to go and those, and we wanted to make those things safe. We had too many fatalities, there were a lot of uh, fatalities that made the news. So I guess at some point, t take us through practically how this would have, you know, take something that we've done and say, how would this have affected what we did? Would it have prevented it? Or would it have, would we, because there was no ability to mode shift in those areas, there's not an opportunity to mode shift, but w those were projects that I think uh, those portions of California really desired and are, have appreciated, and certainly our public safety officers have really appreciated. So, at a future date, I'd, I'd like to hear that. Okay, so we now are on to item, thank you, Ellen. Uh, good discussion, and I think we probably could be here for about three weeks and we'd still be, uh, Having, having a good time, so um, I'd say, whoa, <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, okay, so let's move on now to Mike, I think, or Jim, you're going to grab that microphone. <laughs> I kind of got that feeling there, so. Uh, yes, yeah, Madam Chair, I, I think what, what, for the remainder time, I think we're going to have a very abbreviated focus session with Mike on, on an issue or two. Okay. And then go over to Ray to talk about the CMGC, if that, with, with your permission. I, I'm not known for my brevity, so yes, I want to make sure everybody gets to contribute. So let's, let's I, and I don't care if Ray goes before Mike, we can put the coin, or you guys just <laughs> Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I, I will try to be uh, brief, but I feel like I owe it because some of the district directors are going to be up in front of you, and it's because of things I've been asking their project managers to do with regard to how we're managing our support budget. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit with you and um, see if we're um, in alignment with our thinking and then make any adjustments that we might need to. But I want to I'll try to go th quickly through it, but we do have processes for developing, rather robust, our work plans, mostly from the bottoms up. We have validation steps that we're working on improving, we're trying to actually develop a predictive tool to do from the top down to say, are these reasonable or not? We go through sort of a negotiating process, and then we have a change control process after we've developed our work plans. Um, but I'm going to show you some numbers, too, that show that um, we've been having conversations. Terry and I have had conversations, and uh, some of the concerns, I think, are a reality where we're locking up funds that could be put to better use. I think if we take more risk and lean up our support cost budgets, we can put more of that money into our projects. But it may mean a greater risk that we're going to have to make adjustments to our support cost budget because we've leaned them back. We've tried to assess the risk, we've, we've pulled them back, and then based on those risks, we've had to come back and say we need an adjustment that most of the time we're able to manage ourselves, 
but we may need a CTC action based on the guidelines. And so that will result in what I think you're going to see at the commission meeting this, um, uh, tomorrow and, and, and uh, Thursday, where we're coming to you more often. And so I think it's the right step for us, but I want you to understand why. It's not a mismanagement. To me, it's an, an intentional strategy to try to be better managers of the funds. Now that said, on any particular project, if you have questions, we ought to be able to answer them. I know part of it, um, you have questions on our site visits. My presentation, I could you know, go into this, but in a nutshell, we do have um, documentation in our process beginning at the planning phase to say, look at the project and assess um, your site implications. But we do leave it up to the districts on when to do that. So it is a risk-based decision. We may push it into the zero phase instead of doing it in the planning phase. For instance, if you need a lane closure, if I'm going to invest in a lane closure, if I'm going to expose our, us, the, the, the public, to the, to the traffic impacts of a lane closure and our staff to being out in the field, we want to try to do that at the most effective point. And so that may result in us pushing that out. But again, you ought to be able to ask those questions when we come in for an adjustment and say, when did you do your site visit? What did it result? And you know, did you assess this risk appropriately? And we should have a good answer for you. We require documentation through our change process um, that uh, when we put forth an amendment or a supplemental, we require the districts to say, what was, what is your site visit history? And, and, and how does, is that reflected in the change that we're making? Okay, so forgive me, I'm an old fashioned developer. I love dirt. Um, but, don't you always go out and look at a site before you start I'm not a saying project? we don't. I'm saying when and who. So for instance, if we have a project up at the Oregon border. Yeah, we went there. And <laughs> so you went for a complex project, I believe, but there may be some, you know, simple rumble strip project or something. We do try to do up there is complex. <laughs> Everything. Touche. Um, okay, but pick a yeah. But, but there may be projects where we invest more in that, but I'm not suggesting that we don't. We require an assessment of that site visit on every project, and I believe our best practice is to go out to that site. How frequently, which members of your team, at what exact phase that you do that, right now we leave to the discretion of the project manager okay. and the okay. PDT. Okay. Now that said, we have one district being very proactive, District 8, and they're prescribing when to go out. And so we, as a project management board, are going to look at um, what the results are with, with what they're doing. And that may lead to changes in our practice. And we'll talk about that um, amongst all the district SFPs. How might that reflect on what we're all doing? But right now, it is left up to each district and each PM and each project delivery team to figure out when is the right time to go out to the field. But you should be able to ask that question, and we should have, ideally, a good answer to that every time. Okay. So in order to give Ray um, time for his presentation, let me just go to a slide <laughs> that I think that you're going to um, find of interest. One, our risk-based, we do our risk register, which you're aware of, but we're trying to quantify that risk. We're actually developing a range of costs going forward with our support uh, budget where we look at our uh, most likely and our optimistic and pessimistic. And then we try to quantify that and put that in, into a risk budget. And we say, here's our lean budget, here are my risks. I'm looking at it probabilistically. I'm going to set aside some funds for that risk in order to identify the amount that I should program and then ultimately request for, um, for my allocation. So we're rolling out that training now. So we have new tools, we're rolling out training now to all of the districts in, in doing that. Um, just an example, our documentation says, yes, this is who went out to the field and um, when did we do it. 
we have, I can't remember, when we build our work plan, and I'm going to have to refer to my notes on this part. We have over 650 tasks that we look at that might be in a project. The average project has 490 task assignments, which means we look at the whole, the whole project, what we think we need to do, we look at every, every team that needs to be involved, if you will, every one of those units, and we ask each one of them, what are the hours you need to do this, these components? We actually have sort of a script, what's expected for us to do during this period of time. So we do have a robust process in order to develop those, those work plans. And then we question those, we validate those. And then there's negotiation. The project manager doesn't just simply accept the unit's um, estimate. With that validation, we go through and we um, review those uh, before we incorporate that into, into our work plan. And mostly we're able to manage that internally, but then the change management process, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but it includes the district director, their SFP, headquarters review at multiple levels before we would come to you, that we're, we've, we've done everything that we could figure out to try to resolve the issue ourselves internally, and then we would come to you for a CTC action. When it comes to support costs, We've been reporting to you in our quarterly delivery report. Our highs and lows tend to offset, but when we look at our strike zone range, where we're trying to get between 80 and 120% of our estimate, we're doing that less than half the time. That's something that we're trying to improve. So right now, we're more often we're um, under than over, so we have savings, if you will, Right now, we're running about 5% savings. And most of these projects that we're reporting on are from prior to when we were allocating support. Here's the part that's a little more enlightening. Now that we're allocating support, we're actually going in the wrong direction. So we're programming a certain amount. We get cold feet, if you will. We allocate even more. And then when it comes to what we expend, it's a little bit less than what we had programmed to begin with. For overall, and this is some, some of the conversations we've been having. Are we being too risk averse? So we're trying, again, to lean these budgets back so we put more of that money to work and try to reduce that money that gets tied up that could be put into projects, could be put into the district's variance um, in our asset man management uh, processes. Um, in order to not push projects out because we think we're running out of money. The reality is we've just locked it up and, and, and didn't know we had it. So that's kind of in a nutshell my, my presentation. I want to leave the rest of the time for Ray with, with uh, CMGC, um, but I'll take any questions that you might have. Yes. Commissioner Paul. Mike, when we were up in <clears throat> Del Norte County, you know, we have some projects up there that have been tied up in litigation for a really, really, really long time. Yes. And I guess, is there, is it a situation where there's no sense of urgency or is there just no path forward? I, you know, if, if a project that's a safety project has been locked up in litigation for eight years, at some point, you, I would think for, through project delivery, you'd kind of raise, it would, it would float to the top here at, at the CTC um, as, hey, we have an issue here. And, and we're having, as, as we've noticed on the commission, a lot of projects up in those areas are complex. They have complex environmental issues. Um, and so I guess the, the question is, what are you guys thinking on, on that subject and how are we, uh, you know, I think on 199 we're kind of stuck. And it, see, it seems like the citizens up there are saying, okay, well, where, what, what's going on? So probably a um, multi-part answer to that. We, we recognize we have some projects that, that do are stuck, and, and we're, we're trying to find a path forward. Um, with regard to the resources, part of what we're doing is making, looking at turning some of those back into long leads or contingency projects, saying, let's not lock up the funds for these. Let's, let's, 
recognize where we are on these. We, we have issues to resolve, but let's not hold the funds here. And we'll, 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 we'll circle back once we, we have that breakthrough that we're looking for. On the environmental issues, this is where um, the progress we're hoping to get from 1282. If we get programmatic agreement on uh, positive outcomes with the uh, resource agencies, um, ideally we'll be able to move forward. Um, and there's an understanding. If, you, if your design solution looks like this, then your, your, your permit, your mitigation, whatever, will look like that. And then if you couple that with our advanced mitigation, that we know what to expect, an even better environmental outcome, and it's ready for us at the time that we need it. So, so that's the other part of it. I don't know about the, you know, the legal implications of, of, of some of this. Some of these are just tied up in, in, in ways that it, it's difficult without going through that legal process to break, to break through on, on those. And a lot of them are the coastal projects, um, just all kinds of complexities. A lot of them are big, expensive bridge projects that, um, so we got a lot of dollars that are tied well, they're up. They're expensive, they're not that big of projects. No, they're um, not, but they're, they're not. But they, they've grown to, to be very expensive up there. Um, you know, we, we, we notice it in our, in our shop allocations um, that things that, are, that look like simple box uh, culverts uh, have gotten very expensive. And a lot of it, when you dig into it, a lot of it is, is, is because we're doing a lot of support on mitigation while we're trying to build this thing. So part of it is, is what we're trying to do with, whether it's culverts or small bridges or, or you know, the fish barrier projects. If we can use some of our concepts with accelerated bridge construction, get in and get out and <coughs> reduce the, the, the impacts that we don't even have to mitigate, maybe we can say get in, um, say on a fish project and not impact a run because we're in and out before the, uh, the next um, salmon run, um, then maybe that's another way that we can, one, reduce our costs, but also reduce our environmental impacts and, and, and help our schedule. But I don't think we have a grand strategy that's going to solve all of that. More questions? I have one, one question or maybe a clarification. So you talked about the, the, the projects and that the department has the ability as you're building the work plan um, and the support budgets to either, I guess, build all some of those risks, build that into the cost of, of what you need for support up front, and, and then you may be leaving money behind at the end, right? You don't expend all of those dollars because maybe the risks didn't come, <coughs> come true. Oh, so there's that approach or the other approach, which is recognize the risks, but maybe you have a lean budget but that's why, for example, we have four COS supplementals at this meeting um, because, because you could do it either way, right? You could do it either way. The, you guys could never come to the commission, right, for a supplemental. But what that would mean is 1,000 projects have all got a certain level of padding, and maybe you don't have 1,000 projects because now you only can do 750 projects. Correct. Is that, is that true? Is that's that a, true that's exactly what we're trying to find, that sweet spot um, that we don't over invest in the risks, so we're, we're, we're trying to pull that back. But it does mean that, um, especially when you look at the variation um, of we're not hitting the sweet spot more than even 50% of the time, more of those projects that are higher are going to pop over that threshold of our delegated authority, and we're going to have to come back to the commission more often. And again, this is where I felt I, I owed it to the district directors that are going to be up there in front of you. It's an intentional strategy that we've been working on with the SFPs to try to do that more more often. So some of these are even a calculated risk. <laughs> they are a calculated okay. risk, ideally. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you You're Thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to talk about our CMGC program. That's been in place for a few years. So I usually like to start off with just the way we normally do, to deliver projects just as a baseline. So we usually use a method called design, bid, build. It's our traditional delivery method where we put together 100% design, we put it out to bid, and we award it to the lowest responsible bidder. It's in the public contract code. It says we have to have a complete set of plans. 
and it works for most projects. I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. But there are those projects where they're a little more complex. Um, we put project development teams together for all these projects, but there's a key element missing the contractor that's going to build it. They don't have their input on the project. And so CMGC is a method that actually allows us to bring in the contractor during design, even in the environmental phase, and provide input on the project throughout the life of the project and help us make a better project at the end of the day. Um, when we get part of the design complete or all the design complete, uh, if they give us a price that we fair, think is fair and reasonable, we issue a construction contract and they go out and build it for us. And it's a very efficient method. And uh, we're learning a lot about it. It's still new, so um, we, we don't even know how flexible it can be yet. We're still learning. So another way of looking at it is really a two-phase contract. So we hire them during design or environmental, and it's called a pre-construction phase. They provide pre-construction services. They give us real-time cost estimates. They go out and reach out to subcontractors, DBEs, make sure that we got good participation on the project. Uh, they give us estimates. They do quantity reconciliations with us. And one of the big benefits we're seeing is they go out and negotiate the permits with us. They go out and talk to property owners with us. They go out and talk to utility companies. And they have a lot of, they have a lot of uh, trust with those people. And they can talk in the specifics that we can't as a department because we don't know who the contractor typically is going to be. We're going to award it to the lowest responsible bidder, but we don't know who that is. Now we know who the contractor is likely to be, and we can answer the questions very specifically. And so we found a lot of benefit. Again, if we reach agreement on price, uh, we can issue a construction contract. They go out and build it for us. If we don't, uh, we put it out to bid. So a little background. We got authority for CMGC in uh, 2012. Um, 2498 gave us six pilots. We delivered those projects in 2014, 2015. We experienced quite a bit of success on the early projects, even though we were still learning. And we, over the time, we actually got some more authority to do some more projects. And then in 2018, we went and asked for general authority. So now we have general authority so that we can do it on any project greater than $10 million. So at this point, we're trying to find out what projects are good for the CMGC and also try to ramp up our ability to use the method for the right projects. And feel free to stop me. I'll, I'll talk really fast. So, so what <laughs> filters do you use? I know there's a dollar threshold. It yeah. has to be at least $10 million. But what else makes you think that this would be a good subject project to use this method on? Generally, it comes down to complexity. If you can answer the question, what benefit would a contractor's input have on a project? And you can answer that question. That generally leans towards CMGC. We've also developed a tool back well, in... Well, if I'm a contractor, I'm going to tell you every project. <laughs> <laughs> well, the two things, you know, 80, 70 to 80% percent of our projects are under 10 million. So we're not even looking at a majority of the projects. We're looking at the projects 25, 50 million on above. Um, we developed a tool back in 2008 where we have the district answer a set of questions about the project and it'll spit out a answer about which is the right delivery method for this project. We developed for design build, we developed for uh, CMGC and design bid build. And so we use that tool as well. But we're really looking at um, a very complex staging project, one that's very technically complex, something with a lot of constraints for third parties, stakeholders, right away, um, environmental constraints. And those are things that uh, a contractor can really help us on. And so those are the complexities we're talking about. Yeah, any project can be complex, even a $10 million or less project. But uh, we're looking for where a contractor's input could really make a difference on a particular project. Could I ask a question? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, are you looking at this for like the last chance grade? Oh, we are. Oh, you are? Okay. Yes. Okay. It's, it's on our <laughs> list of potential projects, yeah. The, the difficulty we have in that project is the long delivery time, tying up a contractor for you know, 10 years. Very difficult for them to commit people that long. So we're trying to figure out what's the right time to bring them on. But yeah, we are looking at it as potential, definitely. So why do we want to use CMGC? Um, we think it's an opportunity for faster delivery. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later um, when we talk about packages. Um, cost certainty, we're getting real 
concrete costs from the contractor throughout the life of the project. So we can make real-time decisions based on that information on the project. And so we know where we're at. We're not waiting until we open the bids and then wondering, do we put too much money in there or not enough money in there? We actually have real good real-time information. Constructability. What better constructability input can you have than the contractor is going to build the project and tell you they can build it based on what how it's designed. And so we're expecting a reduction in change orders on these projects because they're more constructible. Risk mitigation, you talk a lot about on delivery methods of who owns the risk. Design build, do you think you're going to transfer most of the risk to the design builder? Uh, design build, build, we own most of the risk because we're the designer of record. With CMGC, we actually talk with the contractor and look for ways to actually eliminate risk. We want to mitigate and minimize the risk. And then at the end of the day, with the risks that are left over, we decide who can actually manage that risk better. And are there more innovative ways to manage risk than just transferring back and forth? And so uh, risk mitigation is big. And then innovation. Um, as a designer for 16 years, I typically design the next project like I designed the last one. With a contractor's input, they're bringing a lot of great ideas that you can look at and um, just be more innovative and come up with better staging plans, better ways of doing the project. So we're seeing a lot of innovation on that. We actually track that. And hey, Ray, part I have of our a question. Mm -hmm. What would be the number one reason that a $50 million project you would decide not to use CMGC? Typically, a $50 million project would be, uh, it's just too straightforward. It's, um, it's a project where, that we can do. A good example is maybe a rehabilitation project. Very okay. simple. We're going to use the same traffic closure scheme that we use on a typical project. So you could have a $100 million project and still say no. Yes, not the right. okay. definitely. Cool. Definitely. Thanks. Yeah. So this is just what the CMGC process looks like, uh, just for comparison purposes. 30% uh, design or less, we would go out and procure the contractor through an RFQ, a request for qualifications. We evaluate those qualifications and we pick the most qualified contractor um, for that particular project. We don't consider price, we're looking at qualifications. Uh, we bring them on board, we award a pre-construction service contract, and then we pay them on an hourly rate based on the hours we need them to provide input on the project, similar to an a and &E contract. Um, when the design's complete, uh, we ask them for a price, and if that price is fair and reasonable, we award a construction contract. And this is one of the first areas where time savings can come in. If we don't have to advertise an awarded project, we can just uh, issue a contract. We're saving three to six months already on a project. And so you can really save a significant amount of time just in that area. The other area we can save time is what we call packages. So you don't have to wait till the whole project's complete. There could be a portion of the project that is complete and ready to go. And if it's on the critical path, you can break out a package and go out and build that piece of the project early. We would come in and get an allocation for that project. We'd issue a separate construction contract. And the contractor would be building that project while we finish up the rest of the design. And so we've seen on a lot of projects where we can really take things off the critical path, especially on projects where we have an environmental window where you have a, you know, three months to get a bridge built or a foundation in the water. Um, or maybe you're waiting for a right-of-way parcel or utility company to get out of the way of the project. You can break out parts into the project and go out and build them early. And so this is an area where I think there's a lot of area we can find some really good savings. Um, the commission actually approved a pilot for Consumers River where we think there's an opportunity to save about two years on the project by breaking it up into five packages. And so we're, we're testing it out on that project, and uh, we'll report on the findings on that. I think it's uh, going very well so far. Yeah, and, and just so the commissioners are aware, because the shop guidelines state that if you're in the year of delivery, you can't um, split a project other than landscape and mitigation. And so what Ray's talking about is in that project, they wanted to be able to split out in the year of delivery these different packages, which, which make more sense for CMGC. So the reason why we're doing the pilot program, um, Ray and I have had a lot of conversations. Um, we'll probably be looking at that and learning some lessons and talking about what tweaks we should make to the shop guidelines specific to CMGC. So maybe this is a naive question, but I bring in a construction manager. Does he or she only work with one contractor? So the construction manager is a licensed contractor that can build the project. So that's what we're calling the construction manager. Okay, so it's not as if, because I could, and in the 
my other day job, my real day job. <laughs> um, you know, you would have a construction manager who was specifically, he was going to manage. Yes. Or she was going to manage that project regardless of who the contractor was. So this yeah. has a uh, built in, you're kind of like getting the foot in the door. We're hiring the prime that's going to build the project. Okay. We're not, we're not hiring an intermediary that's going to go out and hire the contractor. Okay. We're actually so hiring it's the prime. hiring the prime. That's correct. Okay. So who's the prime on Consumnus? Consumnus is granite. Is granite. So yes. That's a, so just for yeah. Southern California, that's a project on the SR99 yeah. uh, south of, of here that had a constricted, um, I don't know what you call a mouse hole through an old railroad, tr railroad truss yeah. that was, had been a safety issue for, I don't know, 40 years. And, and then uh, uh, over the Consumnus River. So it's a, it's a project that has to fix the, 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 the railroad trussle <coughs> mouse hole and then also get you expansion on the Consumnus River all at one time. And so pretty complicated project. And, very complicated. Seems like they, they, I've been watching it phase out every time I come up here, and kind of seems like it's going okay. Yeah, on that project, uh, we did a couple different things. We were able to put in some dirt during a, a, a window where we couldn't go in the river. Um, we ordered girders for the bridge, um, which has a nine-month lead time, and so we were able to order those ahead of time. And then the rest of the project will be delivered this spring, and we'll be delivering it. We also are waiting for our, a railroad uh, CNM agreement, and um, while we're waiting for that, we could be constructing other areas of the project. Commissioner, this seems like a real advantage when we're looking at really highly competitive um, use of, of construction workers with all of the projects that are happening in the state. I know there's been a lot of issues about making sure you could actually get the contractors when you need them. So it seems like this is a really good opportunity to have that predictability. I wanted to ask though, um, we're hearing about tariffs and how they're affecting the ability to deliver projects, especially with certain materials not being able to be ready. Can you talk a little bit about that and how CMGC can help address some of these, you know, unforeseen circumstances? Yeah, so uh, one of the benefits of having the contractor on board, they let us know in real time, these are things that are going to affect your price. Mm -hmm. And maybe these are some things that you can do to mitigate that. Maybe use different materials, order materials farther in advance. And so it can be a real tool in those types of things. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah, that's great. It seems like a wonderful advantage to that. And just building on the point you made as well is, here you're selecting most qualified contractor, and one of the things um, that's a benefit is you actually get some of their most qualified staff as well. And so uh, they're providing you resumes for their key personnel, and we get them for the life of the project, which you don't get to see on other projects. Yeah, it sounds like they're doubly invested this way, so they put their best people on it. That's yes. wonderful. So you mentioned if you can't have a meeting to minds on the price when you go out to bed. Yes. How often does that happen? So nationally, I'm only aware of three times it's happened, and we've only been close, I believe, twice of having to go out to bid. And almost in 70 cases, we've reached agreement on price. Okay. Yes. Well, did you and get I, a good and price? And <laughs> we got a good price, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we come, how we make sure we get a good and fair price. So um, just talking about why we want to bring them on a little bit earlier, we found on the pilot projects, we brought them in a little bit late, and they had some great ideas, and we just couldn't implement them. We were just so late in the project that it wasn't, it wasn't cost effective to go backwards and redesign stuff. And so we're really trying to push it earlier in design and even into environmental. We're seeing a big benefit from that. And this is kind of a graphic that shows that. Um, again, we talk about how we pick them based on qualifications. We're looking at their performance on past projects that are similar to this particular project. Uh, who are their key personnel and who are they going to commit to the project? Um, and then finally, we ask them a little bit about what is your team going to do for us on this particular project? You know, sell us on why you're the best team for the project. And then we typically have an interview with them as well. And so uh, we, we try to select the most qualified contractor uh, for a particular project. Again, I talked a little bit about risk management, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but um, design to build, we own most of the risk as the owner. We're the ones who design the project, and so we have to take responsibility for that. Design build, you can transfer quite a bit of the risk. You can't never transfer all the risk. You couldn't afford it. 
Um, CMDC, we think there's an actually a lower overall risk, and then you have a discussion about who can manage the rest of the risk best. So one of the ways we make sure we get a fair price is we actually hire an independent cost estimator. And we're not looking for someone that does an engineer assessment like us looking at past projects and past bids. We actually hire someone who has been a contractor's estimator in the past and brings that expertise. And they actually do a bottoms up estimate just like a contractor with crews, equipment, labor rates, production rates, and they do a, a, as detailed an estimate as a contractor does. And um, what we find is they participate throughout the life of the project. They make sure the contractor's not leaning down an area where maybe that contractor is the only contractor that can deliver the project. And so we always have the opportunity to go out to bid. And then at the end of the day, they actually validate that we got a fair price. The contractor never sees our engineer's estimate, never sees the ICE price. And then the ICE gets to analyze the contractor's price. And we use an open book estimate where the contractor actually shows us their books to make sure that they can be analyzed to make sure we're getting a fair price. Um, so the bid process is really um, not really a bid. It's really a submittal of a price to the contractor. We have three points of data points. We have the engineer's estimate. We have the independent cost estimate estimate. And then we have the contractor's estimate. And then uh, based on our analysis of that, we go through a reconciliation process uh, to figure out why we're different. And we don't, we don't just look at the ones where the contractor's too high. We look at the ones where they're too low. They might have missed something. We want to make sure it's a, a reasonable price. And if we like that price, we go out to bid. We can issue a contract in two to three weeks, and they can be out there constructing immediately. If we don't, uh, we can cut that contractor loose. We put it out for bid. That contractor is not allowed to bid on it. They're prohibited. Negotiate with the contractor down, like bring that price down. We don't, FHWA, we don't like to have a that. negotiation. The only thing we negotiate is their, their profit, the profit margin that they oh. have. We do negotiate that, okay. but everything else has to be justified. They have, we have to agree on production rates, we have to agree on equipment rates. But as part of that agreement, are you negotiating? Well, no, you're trying to understand why we're different and oh. trying to reach consensus on, you know, it, I think I can use this piece of equipment, but the ICE thinks I can use a different piece of equipment. We have to reach agreement on what's the right piece of equipment to use on the project. Okay, just, yes. Okay. So you might call that negotiation, but it really is trying to reconcile and understand each other and what's the best thing for the project. The one thing I will add on this too, one of the ways that we know we're getting a fair price is any subcontractor, and that's typically you know 40%, 50% of the project, those are all put out to bid. And those, contract, those subcontracts are actually market-based prices. Mm -hmm. And so we know that 50% of the project or so is going to be based on market prices. So I'm not going to go over all these. There's a lot of things on here, but I just want to point out a few. So some of the benefits and challenges. Uh, I mentioned already uh, improved constructability. We are seeing a reduction in change orders. We don't have a lot of projects that are complete and closed out yet, so we don't know exactly what that number is. But Utah has been doing this for a while, and they're seeing around a 50% reduction. We're hoping to get there. Um, delivered in packages. We think there's a real benefit to being able to break a project up and deliver in packages to um, make it the most efficient delivery possible. And so we're, we're experimenting with that. Um, not having to go with the low bidder, but rather, you know, low bidder is not representative of the price you're paying at the end of the project. We actually want a fair price up front, and that should be the price we pay at the end of the project, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. And then the assistance with third parties, that's really where we're seeing a benefit. Um, the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge Foundation Removal Project, I think we'd still be out there taking those foundations out right now. If we didn't have a contractor that had done that kind of work before, and could show us the most efficient way to deliver the project. They went with us to talk to all the resource agencies. They helped us get the permits. They got things in the permits that we probably would be afraid to ask because we knew we would never get them. But they were able to describe how they're going to do that project and, and discuss it in such detail that they were able to convince them to give us better permits or more focused permits. We thought it was Susan on the teapot. <laughs> she had a role. <laughs> Um, some of the challenges, um, there are some higher support costs. We're now paying an extra party. 
Um, we're paying the contractor and we're paying the independent cost estimator. We're estimating that's about two to three percent of construction cost. And uh, some of the projects that are coming late to the game, we didn't budget for that, so we are seeing some rise in our support costs. We're hoping to get the decision earlier in the project so we can budget for it early on. Um, our hope is that that's offset by the savings. Uh, our target is to try to save around 10% on the projects due to innovations from the contractor and a reduction of risk. And we're, in most cases, exceeding that. And so we think that's going to be offset at the end of the day, also in less change orders and claims. Um, sometimes you do have to redesign because the contractor comes up with a great idea and we want to make sure we can implement it. That costs money to redesign on occasion. We try to keep them involved enough that we're not redesigning. We're trying to catch it before we've designed it in the first place. Um, doing an estimate reconciliation on a, a bottoms-up estimate is something that's very new to the department. We really don't have those kinds of skills. And the independent cost vendor helps us, but we've also got to develop those skills in-house so that we understand the language that the contractors speak and also that we um, are able to really make sure that we are getting a fair price. And uh, that's just an education experience that we're developing right now with our program. So why wouldn't we have those skills? So oh, we've been in this business for a while, right? Yeah, so we see bids that come in for particular items of work, uh -huh. but we never see the data that's behind those bids. Well, we don't have, we have to do something to get our estimate. We look at historic bid data. We look backwards in the re most recent bids that we've done and we use that to project forward. And it's a very cost-effective way to do it on because we're not paying the price that we estimate, we're paying the price of the bids. We just need to have a budget number that's within a certain range to be able to award the project. So historic bid base is a very cost-effective way to do that, but if you're sitting across from a contractor, you have to be able to um, get into the numbers like they do mm -hmm. and understand that you're getting a fair price. Well, I, I think they're, what you're telling us is that they speak the same language, right? Contractors do, the and, and, and the independent cost estimator, that's correct. Yeah. So, to me, that's an advantage because, you know, if you don't have a language barrier, I mean, they could also, you know, leave us, the customer, the owner, in the dark. Um, but no, I, I would just hope that our estimators somehow had some tools to be more aligned with that. I mean, how, if I want to be, grow up and be an ICE mm -hmm. estimator, what path am I going to take versus an estimator, one of our estimators? So there's two things you can do. Um, Typically, most of our ICE are people that have worked in the construction industry for a long period of time yeah. doing bids for contractors and they decide to go off and form a company that does this. That's one path. What we found in, in Caltrans is our construction folks are pretty good at estimating this level of detail because they do change orders, they have to fight claims. Well, they got to understand the project. That's correct. So we are getting our con uh, construction folks more involved but they don't have access to the market, the market prices that a contractor does. That's probably the missing piece. Okay. They can talk equipment, they can talk production rates, but we don't have the real-time cost data. That's, that's right. Yes. You know, we're talking about means and methods too. Yes. Right oh, sorry, Jim. Ray, could you just talk about means and methods a little bit? Because um, when you design bid build, we don't necessarily know who the contractor is, correct? That's correct. So when you do design bid build, you're trying to uh, trying to find the worst case in some cases. Who is the contractor that's going to win the project and how are they going to build the project? And you have to design it so that any contractor that wins it can build it. Um, with CMGC, you're actually able to tailor it a little bit more towards that particular contractor. Um, you have to be careful that you don't go too far in that direction, but uh, you actually talk about the actual means and methods they're going to use and that allows us to get a better, more realistic price. Uh, the last thing I'm just touching on here, uh, challenges are really delivering these projects under a design, bid, build set of rules, both inside the department, funding, um, statutory, 
And so we often are having to find ways around our own rules and how we deliver projects because this is a, a very flexible method that allows us to do some things that we couldn't do on design, bid, build. And we're trying to find our way through that. What is that flexibility and how do we create that flexibility in our processes so that we can deliver these projects more efficiently? Um, we talked a little bit about not splitting a project in the year of allocation. That's a rule that we have to deal with. And CMGC gives us some flexibility that we may not always be able to take advantage of because of those types of things. So, you know, Terry and I have been talking about what are some of the, what are some of the things we can build into the process to allow that flexibility and find the most efficient way to deliver a project. So we've got a lot of processes in the department that we're working through, and I'm sure we're going to find some statutory changes we might want to make or possibly work with the CTC to find things that could help us be more successful in the program. Um, it's a, I think it's a really good tool for us, and we're, we're learning a lot about it, and I think um, we're going to be very successful with having this in our toolbox. Any other questions I can answer? Any other questions? Only thing I have under the benefits time, and I think that was inherently built into that through maybe me extracting some of your comments to, but can you opine on that? Why time wasn't a benefit there, or time savings? No, I think it was a benefit. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it was a benefit. I guess I didn't put it there. Um, but yeah, we, it is definitely a benefit. At time to that rank. <laughs> I will. Hey, it's a fast <laughs> yeah, it is faster delivery. I did talk about it. It definitely is. It's not the main selling point of it, but it is. A, it is a selling point. Well, I, I think it's important, though, and I don't make light of it because time is money. He wrote it down. is. He wrote it down. I know. I have it. It's good. Yes. Yes. Any questions? How about from our audience? Anybody out there have questions? Comments? I have one. Yes. Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Bruce Gatero with Caltrans Programming. Uh, Ray, you were working with us on Highway 158, which was an ITIP project. And from the perspective of programming, we were only able to deliver that project because of the involvement of the CMGC, because of the flow of funding and stuff. Yes. And your work with the CMGC contractor was actually instrumental to our actually successfully delivering that project, where I don't think we would have otherwise been able to deliver it under normal circumstances. Can you shed some light on yeah. how, how you were able to do that? Yeah, so, so that was a Craver Junction project, and um, it, was a, it was a $160 million plus project. It was going to take pretty much all the stip in a single year, and so we tried to spread the money out over for several years. And by having the contractor on board, we were actually able to cash flow the project over three years and uh, gave them limits of what they could spend per year. They could go faster if they wanted to, but we would only pay up to the amount we were allocated annually. At the end of the day, we were able to get the funds voted up front, but we still cash flowed it. And so that's something we couldn't have done under design to build. Another good flexibility. Okay, well, if we don't have any more comments, no public comments, how about from my colleagues? No? I wish we had more workshops, because I really like them, great. guys. So anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we'll see you all tomorrow, I'm sure, one way or another. Thanks. Meetings adjourned. Great work.